five, four, three, two, one, go. You're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. Typical, isn't it? I've been out of jail five minutes and already I'm in a hot car. This is the South Mafia. They'll be waiting for you. In this country, they drive on the wrong side of the road. Well, I hope he likes spaghetti. We are about to do a job in Italy. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Cinemarcade. This is the podcast about movies, video games, and the sparks that fly when those worlds collide. And apparently something I said is already killing Justin. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I went to pull up the Wikipedia article for the Italian job because I, part, as part of the podcast, whenever something's referenced, I usually like open a tab for later or something. Okay. To investigate. And I spelled Italian wrong and I spelled it, I was spelling it very wrong. Okay. So right now my search is just the tits. The tits. <laughs> um, I haven't completed That's... it, but I, it was one of those moments of like, how did I manage the, oh, um, I, Okay. Well, as you may have guessed from that, this is the podcast about the tits. Um, <laughs> we, we watched the tits. No, we watched the Italian job the, from 1969, the original. Uh, one of the rare movies that um, I have not seen uh, going into this. So oh, what, are we, what are we Googling now? Well, I, I then accidentally did the Italian job job. Okay. <laughs> and then hit the, the listen to me button. And uh, it then started adding everything you said to the end of it. Okay. All right. All right. That's I, the end of Google Corner. I'm cooking. That's you, the end of Google you do Corner. do work in tech. You know that. I, yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> uh, so we are kicking off a two-episode miniseries here. We're going to be talking about the original Italian job and then the remake, which I think is the first time that's happened for us. Usually we do like a, a, a series of sequels or something, but we're hitting the... Original and the remake, I think that's only going to happen for us one other time for another series, ironically, where the remake has Mark Wahlberg in it. So, you know, go figure. That? We're going to be doing uh, Planet of the Apes. Oh. Yeah, so Planet one... of the Apes has Mark Wahlberg in it? Yeah, the, have... the reboot, the horrible, horrible seen... Tim Burton version, yeah. I haven't seen a single Planet of the Apes. I love so the Apes movies. I love I'm... them. So when I was a kid, we'd go to the library and we'd get all the old Planet of the Apes, and they're so good and awful at the same time yeah so thrilling to watch and i i feel bad because i haven't gotten it on the new and i I, i've heard that the new apes are really good they are yeah Uh, i haven't seen the brand new one yeah yeah. the brand like i've heard somebody say the brand new one was amazing so i'm just like i i I guess um I, i just i like the practical makeup and so when it's cgi like sometimes i do struggle with cgi where i just like my brain just like yeah refuses to read emotion on it uh but I, i've got to give it a go i've got to give it a those go. those movies really uh thread the needle on that like really well and that's the andy circus of it all so uh, they they rebooted and is it now a consistent from the reboot no okay oh, or did they just forget they, about the mark Wahlberg one they they, they ignored that movie okay everybody hated that movie they ignored it it's terrible otherwise i was um, really curious what they did to write out mark Wahlberg. no they they had to reboot it entirely to to well, get out of that it's situation easy to double re- reboot. Yeah. like it, it's easy to ignore things because in the planet of the all the planet of the apes movies they shift wildly in time yeah and so you'll see like the the apes begin the thing and then you'll see like 50 years later when the apes have like started their revolution and, yeah and so on and so forth um yeah so but this is not about planet well, of the apes this I'm time curious, around did they make three games did... there there's only two games there's uh, one based on the original movie and then one based on the 2001 tim burton movie and they are uh they were released at the same exact I time weirdly objectively do not know if the original movie is a good movie but i love it so much and i will defend it <laughs> it is to the t- 
<laughs> no, it is genuinely a great movie. Okay, I, I, no, like, I, I've, I've, I've watched, watched them a so couple times. times. I really, I love the first four of those. I think uh, uh, Battle for the Planet of the Apes oh, is a little Battle. weak, but uh, the rest are really good. Uh, if anybody out there uh, is capable, and I doubt this is uh, gonna anybody's gonna fit this criteria, but if anybody out there is capable of making it so that they make a game for the third reboot movie before we get there, yeah, just so that we get to do three reboots in a row, that'd be pretty funny. Yeah, that'd be pretty funny to do. <laughs> no, but we're we're going back to 1969 for the Italian Job. Nice. Uh, this is uh, directed by Peter Collinson, written by Troy Kennedy Martin, and it stars Michael Caine, Noel Coward, Benny Hill, Rafa Valone, Tony Beckley, Rosano Brazzo, and Maggie Bly. So yeah, this, this uh, is a new movie to me. Um, I'd never gotten around to it. I, I know this is a huge one in the UK. And it was largely kind of underseen or unknown over here for a long time, kind of ironically, until we got an American remake. Uh, and so it, it's my first time getting to it. And I had a blast and a half watching this movie. I think this one is so fun. It's just got impeccable vibes all the way around. Amazing car stunts. It's funny. It's lively. This is kind of the cross-section of all of our individual interests as hosts here. Because Justin's a big car guy. Uh, J-Ban lived in the UK and like loves British culture and classic movies. And I love a heist film, you know. And this is kind of bringing all of those elements together in a really fun package. Um, so, a little bit of background on this movie. We need to talk about Michael Caine. Because uh, <laughs> this... This was a huge breakout for him. He's already been kind of up and coming in the UK. Um, he's, you know, uh, his his real name. He's he's a very uh, lower. He came from very lower class, like British um, upbringing. You know, in in London, like he's a a classic Cockney in the in the in the traditional sense of the word. Birth name Morris Micklewhite. I don't know if people knew no. that. Yeah, yeah. Morris Micklewhite. Morris I Micklewhite. See why you'd change that? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's hard to fit on a marquee. He but, could have uh, been the original Eminem, though. Yeah, he could have been. He could have been. He's the, he is the original Eminem. You know, we are all familiar with him now, of course. He's a two-time Oscar winner. He's a, a eternally reliable character what actor. What his Oscars for? Uh, they're both supporting actor Oscars. One was for Hannah and Her Sisters, the Woody Allen movie, and mm -hmm. the other was for Cider House Rules oh, in 99. Okay. So, um, but he was a classically trained stage actor who used to take a lot of like stuffy like nobleman roles playing a lot of royalty where he really had to hide his accent behind a, a more traditional like posh British accent and he was one of the first people to really kind of mix it up and add a little bit of rougher cockney edge to his performances he really in his early days he really represented kind of like this bold brash new face of like the British mod cinema you know the very much of the 60s and he, he plays a lot of, like, charming cads in movies like Alfie and, and uh, Ipcris Files and then this, you know, like. So he, he's, he was a grittier, cooler, more macho sort of reinvention of the classical British movie star. Well, and he was definitely building off of the reputation of James Bond and Sean Connery. And, like, he's definitely still uh, the fancy... Uh, the idea of the, having the perfect suit uh, that was so prevalent in the 60s, uh, whilst also having the swinging lifestyle. Um, I, I don't know if we want to start talking about the movie yet uh, <laughs> and his swinging lifestyle. Oh, boy, does this man swing. Uh, <laughs> this man gets around. I think he has... We, we did the math on this. He has sex with at least 13 women in the opening 30 minutes of this movie. Uh, to be fair, like seven or eight of them were all at once. So, you know, he does what he can. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think Michael Caine is so fun in this movie. Uh, and he's just really bringing a lot of, like, raw charisma to this part. Um, uh, I think he's just an incredibly watchable actor. And he's just one of those guys. He's just so reliable. He Every time he shows up, he's going to be putting in work and doing so a great job. My So this isn't the first time I've seen um, The Italian Job. Uh, so when I was uh, going to uh, college in Scotland, uh, The Italian Job is kind of uh, famously beloved the way Scarface, by college student, ma male college students, the way that Scarface is beloved by male college students in the States. And like uh, the first time I watched it, was with my boyfriend and he just he wanted me to love it so much and I was like I was okay 
Um, yeah, that's a that's a lot of expectations to put on something. Well, and yeah, it's hard because like I, I I initially like I was rocking up here and I was like, yeah, I don't know, I think it's overrated. And then we were watching clips from it, and I'm like, this is really good. And I'm like, there are so many things about this movie I love. So I don't know whether I have a, I have a very like I don't know what I actually think of this movie. I mean, um, that's that's fair, and you can marinate on it. I mean, and it's it, it is. A movie that definitely has kind of like a saggy middle section for me. You know, I really, I love like the opening. <laughs> so Just like me too. To it's start okay. off by being negative so I can be positive later. Okay. I think the saggy middle is like, so I feel like other heist movies have taken um, inspiration from this heist movie in creating a better version of the middle yeah uh, which is the plotting situation where you're setting up the uh the heist and for the things that i think are weakest about this movie are uh the heist men the heist men the heist men uh, yeah the heistmen. Um, they have the, the, the criminal element because they have so many like this crew is huge he's got like a 20 person crew for this which makes sense for the 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 job that they pull but it is a little like most of the time you watch a heist movie and it's like a small specialized crew. At most, you have 11. Like, yeah. you know, that's that's your top off. You like it. Well, and uh, the most in individualized heist men. Uh, I'm going to keep. Uh, I like heist double, men. No, I'm I double down on that. Yeah, usage, I like it. Uh, was Benny Hill and his, uh, I believe, the first ever portrayal of a computer programmer. One on, of them. Uh, uh, on screen as a raging pervert. <laughs> Which is very, okay, so Benny Hill, yeah, he he's like third build in this movie, uh, and it's one of the rare movies that he actually did. If you're listening to this and you're not familiar with who Benny Hill is, he was a very, very popular British comedian who had a long running show that yeah, basically if you've ever seen you've seen this parodied probably before a million times if you ever see somebody like running around in fast motion they're like chasing each other over yakety sacks you know -na 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 -na. Yeah. that is from the Benny Hill show that, that is the only reason why I know who Benny Hill is I, I would have been in the same boat my dad when we were kids uh, bought a VHS tape of like the best of Benny Hill because he had a memory of it being so funny like when he would watch it in the 70s that he put it on for us and like almost immediately we are bombarded with racist jokes with sexist jokes it's like super it, sexist he he does like a straight up like ching chong chinaman act like with with the buck teeth and everything it is so offensive yes. and he and, often chase so chases scantily clad women and yeah it's just like uh, and we were just watching his kids were like dad what are we why is this funny like we well, do not get it and he's like yeah I do not remember I was like I, so, I, the drugs must have been really good <laughs> <laughs> well it's so interesting comedy in the 70s was so uh, like you can watch something like the Carol Burnett show and it holds up it does yeah uh, and then you use something like uh, like Goldie Hawn I can't remember Hee Haw I think it was that she no was, she was on Laughing Laughing yeah yeah, yeah. and which is very variable but they definitely use her as this like uh, ditzy 70s girl which uh, yeah. is definitely in the Italian job as well like, a little bit it's very having these pretty blonde women be like oh I'm so stupid <laughs> I mean you could see why this would be on like a, a British college boys wall right like it, it is very masculine it's got a very kind of like brash energy and the only woman uh, with any substantial like screen time in this movie is just kind of a ditzy blonde who disappears before all the fun stuff happens you know so like it does kind of enforce a lot of these sort of macho stereotypes and that's that's something I'm not crazy about but there is a really great construction to this movie and it's a really fun uh, kind of tour of swinging London and then of touring in Italy where most of the job actually takes place. Um, we start off in prison. We start off in prison, and I love this. I love the British prison design. You know, like with those those uh, uh, fenced in yeah. like walkways and stairs and stuff like that. I've seen that in a few movies. Uh, well, there there is. A, I do kind of like the trope of the mob boss in prison being catered to. <laughs> That's a great bit here. So the mob boss, the, basically the, the, the head of the entire British mafia is in prison in this movie uh, but he still kind of runs everything. And now, so the mob boss here is played by Noel Coward. This is one of his last ever film performances. Noel Coward is one of the great British playwrights. Like mm -hmm. he, he had a bunch of like 
very successful comedies and he was sort of renowned for his wit you know and he kind of personify his, his the the performances that he gives he kind of personifies this sort of like pre-war stodgy englishman like upper class englishman like so a lot of time if you're oh my oh yes oh, I, I do believe i'll have my sunday papers you know if you're doing like a really uh thick impression of a british person you're often doing a noel coward whether you realize it or not you know when i was young and foolish <laughs> You know, before you know better, you're like, Winston Churchill is great. Because you, you hear the speech. <laughs> sure. And you're like, wow, he wants to fight Nazis on the land, on the sea, in the air. And you're like, wow. And then you grow up and you learn and you learn more. And you learn how big a twat he was. Oh, yeah. And like one of the things that Churchill did is like uh, Noel Coward was going to get a knighthood in the 40s for all his work that he did during the war. But Churchill was like, nah, I think he's too gay. Uh, mm. And and so as a consequence, he didn't get his knighthood until the seven, I think the 60s or 70s. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Churchill. Like, I used to love Winston Churchill. I like there was a picture. Of, I took a selfie with me and Winston Churchill when I was in um, at his tomb. And I was just like, and now, now I'm just so ashamed of, of how much I admired. I love, like, I, hey. that's a great speech. He's a great speaker. I'm just, I, I'm just thinking about the the phrasing of like, I took a selfie with Winston Churchill at his tomb. Yeah. And now in my head, I'm like, I don't remember. I'm assuming Winston Churchill was dead when you were there. Yes, Winston Churchill um, was as long like, dead. Like, was it an open casket? No, there was yeah. a statue of him. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't know these things. I'm just imagining you just kind of like leaning down, throwing the peace sign over the casket. I mean, Um, I I still adhere to the line from the show Firefly. I think it's still very true. It's just I imagine everyone who's ever had a statue built of him was some kind of son of a bitch or another. And that also now applies to Joss Whedon, unfortunately. So, you know, I think it's very true. Like if, if you're accomplishing great things, you're usually a pretty complicated, fucked up person. And it's never as clear cut as uh, the history books make it. So complicated guy. Well, and he was also one of the weird things. So both him and President uh, Johnson like to walk around naked as like a power move. And you're like, are you a nudist? Or are you just trying to show people your junk? Yeah. Like, and President Johnson was always trying to show people his junk. And <laughs> Look, he got he, the name for a reason. Well, he, like even Benjamin Franklin was like, he's sending women air like air baths. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm just like, well, is there just suddenly a level of like a, a privilege that you get to where you're just like, hey, everyone's got to see my junk. I mean, I, I, I really can't explain that mindset. To be honest with you, I'm asking you for like, as, as men, is this a thing that you do? No, <laughs> no, no, no. I the I, I, I really do not. I mean, we're way afield here, but like, I really do not understand the calculus that goes into that move, the unsolicited dick pic. I, yeah. I genuinely right? don't understand. Like, what, what are you expecting to happen? I've never even taken a picture of it before. Yeah, there it you is go. Fully on off the books yeah it's <laughs> off the grid the it's living in a shack in the woods yes. don't bother it it's yeah. got uh, a windmill wait, wait. justin's <laughs> dick is the unabomber <laughs> we got him guys we got him finally that should be the takeaway that everybody gets from this episode <laughs> justin's dick is the unabomber <laughs> Oh, Jesus. All right. All right. That's I had a, what I should call it. I had a segue to get back on track a while ago, and I lost it because that was too good. Uh, oh, no. I was going to... Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned that Noel Coward was kind of denied knighthood for being too gay. This is a movie that actually, like, depicts homosexual characters on mm-hmm. screen and without, like, any shame or, or, like, teasing them, really, at all. Like... There's the the uh, the guy at his tailor who's like you know clearly meant to be very effete and is like uh, ripping his clothes and then you have Camp Freddy, uh, like a main character like who's in the crew. This was the first time the word camp had been used to identify someone as gay in a film, um, so that's like British oh. slang for that. So this is the first time that that's happened, um, and I feel like it's pretty non-judgmental of them, like. They're not. They're not not being depicted as like a. Uh, it's not being depicted as like sinful or, or jokey or anything like that. He's just. He's a trusted member of the crew. Yeah. 
Um, you know, so I thought that was interesting, like seeing some of the sexual politics on screen here. And all right, so we should talk about all the the orgy scene or <laughs> implied orgy. Well, it's funny. Uh, Justin and I watched uh, Austin Powers just this earlier this week. Nice. And you I, watched all of it. I watched a you, third of it. Yeah, Justin can't stay awake uh, yeah. during watching of movies if he's big on middle a couch, aged dad if you energy. Hand him a blanket. I or a dog. If, if I'm on a couch, you hand me a blanket. You hand me a dog. Oh, so funny. I'm we, gonna sleep. We were watching it with like six or seven people, and then Justin just softly snoring, and we yeah. were just was like giggling and taking pictures of him. Drawing dicks on him. Yeah, <laughs> drawing drawing unibombers on his face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it was so funny because like two little girls, it was their bedtime, and they they both st- stayed up later. <laughs> Justin. they, Justin's out. Yeah, they uh, they beat me on that one. Okay, but you were watching Austin Powers, and so there, this uh, I think there is a lot of the Italian job in Austin Powers. Yeah, like 100%. obviously they were going back to this like swinging air. It is not a mistake that Michael Caine was cast as Austin Powers' dad in the third yeah. one. Like that is a direct reference to all of these movies that he's doing. But this scene in particular, it's uh, uh, he's ju- Charlie Croker is our main character. He's just out of prison, and his girlfriend takes him back to a hotel where she has a quote unquote gift for him, which is seven scantily clad beautiful women. He keeps saying seven. And I think it was eight, but I don't you know think if it was you're eight? counting his girlfriend or not. Oh, I don't think I was counting her. Yeah, Look, yeah, I my, my bad. Yeah, because she was too like distracted the, to count. She was like, <laughs> she was like the MC, you know. Yeah. Well, it was really funny because they were all like, "Hello, Charlie. Ciao, Charlie. <laughs> Bonjour, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Ni hao, Charlie. Yeah, it's it, they're really like going around the world. Everybody gets a line in order, like it's a high school play or something, or like an elementary school play. But yeah, she's just like, okay, well, which one do you want? And he's like, all of them. (laughs) And then we get like a really funny smash cut to him, like walking out of the room, like clearly exhausted and almost looking shell shocked. Like he's, he's just been through the trenches. Uh, That's a horrible phrase right there in this (laughs) context. But yeah. And then, and then, and then he, as he was arriving at the hotel, he'd gotten a message to meet somebody in another room. Yeah. And so he goes and meets her, and then they have sex too, presumably. Yeah, it's Immediately something, after. something that I find annoying. Uh, and I don't know if it's sexist or it just makes me mad. Mm. But he starts taking his shoes off before he even kisses her. Yeah. And it just, I find that offensive. He's down like, to business. You don't know, like, you don't know if she wants first base or home run shut the fuck up and kiss her you son of a bitch <laughs> yeah a little romance why not Look, you know i don't know I, there's been times when i've definitely been like all right these shoes i'm gonna stop whatever <laughs> i'm doing yeah I'm taking them off get rid of them get rid of them yeah like, he, he, he literally just walked down a hotel corridor maybe six rooms yeah i mean right. the, the However, refractory period is a real thing like you need to you need to recoup one, here buddy yeah, yeah. buy a little bit of time have some two, gatorade she's on a bed Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get in a bed with my shoes on. It's a hotel. Who cares? (laughs) Change it. It's not the. It's not the matter of the bed. You just don't want to sleep in your boots. Well, I think a more romantic scene would have been him kissing her versus him being like, "Oh, look at me! I've got to take off my shoes and have sex again." Yeah. Well, whist me. But then Uh, we see like a few scenes later, and he's already like. Back at it with the group sex. He's already got, like his girlfriend catches him with three other women that she chases out in their underwear, and, it's and like, then she's mad at them. So he's like hyper virile, like super masculine man, and this is just not like this is not the way that like British actors were presenting themselves at the time until other Michael Caine kind of like Bond. other than James Bond. Yeah, so that, it, like the combination. I feel like uh, Michael Caine's Charlie Croker is an updated version of James Bond. So, yeah, like I feel like he's. Uh, even though so I get annoyed with the ditzy like oh uh, thing but at the same time he's more like it, the sex feels more egalitarian than like a James Bond sex. it does like, it, it, it does feel like everyone is you know it, yeah it, everyone feels like they're having a good time you know whereas like James Bond has sex because it's just what he's supposed to do and he seems very bored and detached all the time like Michael Caine shows up in that hotel room and he's just like a kid in a candy store he's 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 so excited he's been in jail for two years he's very excited about this Um, so there is that kind of like there's sort of a freewheeling kind of like fun loving sort of sense to it that makes it feel a little less icky than perhaps maybe what uh, Benny Hill is doing in this movie yeah it's so interesting because like the um 
the female uh oh god what was her name Dude's uh name. lorna lorna yeah uh lorna like uh she steals the pakistani cars ambassador she arranges the hotel and she then she steals she's the gets, cars ambassador uh, oh the the the, the, uh, the ambassador's car ambassador's yeah whatever car. yeah um hardy har har justin <laughs> i'm look, glad i can make you laugh look uh there's lights. <laughs> the, the sun is out, and that's weird for us. It is. Yeah, we're we're midday. We're, we're it's it's a it's a balmy summer day, and we're we're recording a podcast. Yeah. So and I'm and Justin just woke up. And uh, <laughs> should we should we out him? Should we out him on this no, episode? We've no, already no. we've already uh, we've already exposed who his his penis is and living out in the woods. <laughs> but. Uh, but <laughs> Um, yeah, no. fine. I'll do it. I forgot to watch the fucking movie. <laughs> I I'm literally I'm getting like I woke up. Yeah. Uh, I you know browsed Reddit for a few for a few, and then I got a shower. I get out of the shower, and I'm reaching for my toothbrush, and I'm like starting to you know as I normally do when I brush my teeth, think about the day, and uh, I immediately think, oh yeah, podcast. It's going to be great. What movie was? It? Yeah, I didn't watch the movie. That's why I don't know what it is. <laughs> Which is totally fair. Uh, but I mean, you kind of got a good experience of it because we did sort of the 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 greatest hits we, version of what, this movie. We skipped around greatest, a bit, and this is what made me second guess what my opinion on this movie was. Right? Because like when I was we were watching the like the greatest hits, we ended up watching an hour of the movie because so much of this movie is spectacular. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's the thing. Like you, I, I was trying to do even a faster version, and you're like, "Oh no, we got to watch this part. No, we got to watch this part." Like, yeah. yeah. So there, there are a lot, and and this is a it, this is a 93 minute movie. It really moves along. It, it, it clips, but yeah, there are except for the saggy part. Uh, yeah, well, it, it's mostly oh, the mafia so. stuff for me because the mafia stuff doesn't end up being very consequential and, ultimately, and it takes so long well yeah i think also because the characters of the heist men uh or the criminals i love is, that term uh, by the way we're keeping it forever of the, of the criminals it's so much of it is just charlie shouting at them as opposed to, to them having character development and actually being a part yeah. of the story that is it is like uh steve said earlier they're just a bunch of children and yeah he's, he's like a kindergarten teacher so i feel like that dynamic uh was mm-hmm. a little um it's a little repetitive. It's a not, shift, yeah. Not to get too far ahead of us, but I think that this will be an interesting point for us in the next uh, movie. Um, yeah. Because I, I feel like they handle it much better with the different members of the crew. They make it smaller. That's the th- that's they make the, it smaller. That's the thing. What what you have here is kind of a classic like Hobbit situation yeah. where you have thirteen dwarves and they can't really have any screen time and they all kind of like blend together. So like you 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 line up all the dwarves and ask me to like name each one of them and I can't do it. Same here with like the the heistmen in this scene. But the point of it is to be more of they are one more obstacle for Charlie, but it is a bit of a shift because we have fun, freewheeling, like sex having early Michael Caine in the early part of this movie. And then he has to kind of become like all business sort of school marmy for the whole middle he, chunk before he gets to like be fun again. Uh, he, it made me feel like he was the foreman of the crew. A little bit. I mean, like, he is the only, it's kind of funny that he is the only competent one pretty much. Like in, he's got all these guys that he doesn't really trust any of them. Uh, Something that I think is also really interesting is uh, he's he's the, the, the leader of the crew, but in other movies, that person is usually the mastermind. Right. And in this movie, while he does do some stuff... The the masterminding is done ahead of time by a person who dies in the opening scene. Right. And yeah. He passes on all of this information. He passes on this is how you're going to hack the uh, the television the tele the the CCTV based yeah. uh, the traffic, traffic center lights, yeah. the traffic system. Um, this is how you're going to do this. This is how you're going to do that. And like he lays out the biggest hurdles and how to get over them and so then it's a lot more of like he's just supervising it yeah 
It, it's it yeah, it's like a contract thing. Yeah, it, it, this isn't like again to compare it to Ocean's Eleven. This isn't like exactly the 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 leader of the crew isn't organizing everything. He's basically like hired well, the, muscle well, in, a, well, the to, in a way. The leader of the crew is dead. Bro, uh, yeah, Rosanna Brazzi. Rosanna Brazzi, who I was just like, well, look what you did after South Pacific. Yeah, uh, which was really funny because he play he plays like the South Pacific guy with such a thick. Um, French accent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. But his name is Rosan Lobrazzi. Like, he is very Italian. <laughs> very Italian. Very Italian man. Like, uh, uh, very class. Like, I, I love the whole vibe of middle aged Italian men in the 60s driving oh, sports cars. Like, it's it should be cringy. So, it should, but like, I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh, maybe I'm a car I, guy. I'm such a fan of Fellini. Yeah. Even though he's a piece of shit. I love him. He's I a love philanderer. his work. Was, um, was. R.I.P. <laughs> um, and uh, like Anna Manini, I don't know if you've ever seen her. She's mm. like one of the best actresses that's ever existed in yeah. the entire history of the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, love her. Her face. Ah! Oh. But, um, but so many of the Italian um, actors at this time have such perfect suits and they walk around <sighs> and they drive and you're just like, you're so fucking cool. Yeah. So cool. The fashion is incredible in this movie. Like everybody looks amazing. Like you, you don't even, it's not even very garish. Like there are hints of that. Like when he goes to the tailor, like he's got these pattern shirts and everything like that. And he's got very bright colors in his suits, but uh, it's really a very timeless look, yeah. and Michael Caine is just like built for making these like long suits. You know, he he just looks so good in these. Um, and I mean, fluffy hair. Fluffy I was talking hair. About that earlier uh, when you're making um, Justin watch the movie mm-hmm. uh, was like I just like something about the. 60s 70s and 80s like everyone's hair is so fluffy and like the hair of the men is so fluffy and like long and shaggy yeah and like a lot of the uh the criminals or the heistmen uh have such fluffy hair yeah yeah no i i just the vibes overall just are amazing throughout and you know the whole heist section of it is kind of surprisingly slapdash they spend a lot of time setting up this heist and it's very complicated it involves uh, causing a massive traffic jam in the streets of Turin so that they can uh, basically just take an armored vehicle full of gold and then escape with it, you know? So that's their whole plan, which facilitates uh, the first ever on-screen cyber attack, which is an interesting thing for 1969. Yeah. Like, they have to basically break in, swap out one of these reel-to-reel uh, computer thing uh, tapes for a different program that's going to reroute all the traffic and cause the jam. But then when they actually do the heist, it's it's little more than a smash and grab. You know, they are I one of my favorite parts about the fact that there was like 20 people on this crew was uh, it literally just turned into a bunch of guys with like baseball, cricket, bats, whatever. Yeah. Just smacking everyone. I think they, they just were two by fours, but I'm not sure. They were. They were just they, like big planks. They, yeah. They, uh, some of the ones that I saw were more shaped. Yeah. And so that's why I was thinking, like, maybe a cricket bat. That's not a cricket bat. Cricket bat, bat, that is, no. I I couldn't tell, yeah. It was some kind of. It's a blunt object, yeah. Some kind of blunt object that was shaved down to a handle, because they were holding it kind of like a handle. Yeah. uh, And not like a two by four. But either way, they (laughs) they were just running around smacking like there's a convoy and they just like ambush one of the vehicles in the convoy with three dudes and bats and just smack the dudes. Yeah. (laughs) And then they just move on. And they 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 literally just like they cause chaos in the streets. They form a barricade. They they uh, blow off the back of the truck and then they just take it, unload all the trucks. And this is where we meet. The other main characters of this movie and of this series, it's something we really need to talk about because this is a big part of both of these movies. The Mini Cooper. Oh, yeah. The Mini Cooper. Uh, Iconic British cars. Little tiny things that... And so now Justin is the car expert, so uh, I want to pick your brain on this one a little bit too because... I was never clear if the Mini Cooper was ever like a cool car or if this kind of recontextualized it the same way that like Back to the Future did for the DeLorean, you know, which was like this big failure that suddenly became cool because that movie was so big. My understanding was that they were very much just like a generic economy car for a while. Yeah. And then this this movie and some other things really spurred the popularity of it. There was a guy named John Cooper mm. who uh, I think was involved with like Formula One and engine making and stuff. Okay. And he came in at one point to make like souped up versions of the Mini Coopers to sell. 
Um, they're called the John Cooper Works or JCWs. Okay. But uh, I don't think that they really had anything related to like anything cool or action-y with them. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the the central kind of thesis of this movie, and I think the, the reason it's become such an uh, enduring hit over in the UK... It's just that this movie is British down to its very core. So to the point where when they were making this movie, uh, they partnered with Fiat, who really, really wanted to for them to use Fiat cars for the chase scenes. And they refused. Like, they turned down a lot of money to be able to do that because they wanted this to be Britain versus everyone. They wanted this to be the most British possible cars in the colors of the British flag, no less, uh, racing through the streets of London and being completely, or through the streets of uh, uh, Europe and being completely untouchable. Well, and I feel like that brings up uh, another thing is that, like so many cool movies, uh, this place has a real uh, shines a real spotlight on Turin. You really get an idea of the geography of Turin, about the architecture of Turin. Mm-hmm. You get the hit the the main sites of Turin, uh, like the. Um, I don't remember the the name in the Italian, but the stadium that they drove up, uh, like the on uh, that's a was a basketball and like a, an Olympic sports mm. uh, stadium. Uh, that that was just it was really cool. And, um, go ahead. They the when they were driving through the, the Land Rover, they were driving past really famous museums. Yeah, yeah, we get we get a good sense and. It's it's a kind of a masterstroke to have these little cars too because and, the whole heist revolves around them causing bumper bumper traffic that they can't drive through. So they need to have these little cars that can drive on the streets and in the back alleys and like on the sidewalks if they need to. Yeah, it's it's very clear that whomever uh, somebody very involved in the making of this movie was a car person yeah um the the opening sequence is shot with a lamborghini maria Mm -hmm. which is mira i never know how to pronounce it m-i-u-r-a a a pretty rare car it's like a two million three million dollar car these days and i've pulled up um they don't sell very often no um and so, yeah, it's always very interesting with cars like this. Uh, and then also, uh, they they picked Turin to film it, which was home to one of the largest car uh, factories in the world at the time, owned by Fiat. Right. Coincidentally, we've got Fiat there. Yeah. And something that I had mentioned during it was there's a scene where they basically are... The Mini Coopers are on like a rooftop racetrack. Right. And that was legitimately a testing track for the Fiat factory. It was on the roof of the factory building spread out. Um, It was kind of like an oval track with very, very notably banked uh, turns. And that was their test facility. They started building the car on the ground floor. They finished it on the fourth or the fifth floor. I think yeah. The fifth floor. And then they brought it up to the roof. They tested them all on the roof. And then they brought them down and then they shipped them out to sell them. Um, and so just like just having picked that location, like one, it's a location with so many other things. Yeah. But they also definitely knew what they were doing. Like they picked some of these locations so well. I mean, the the last 30 minutes of this movie are basically just a sustained car chase. Yeah. And it's spectacular because it's, you get a combination of like a stunt show and a travelogue. So you're getting to yeah. see a lot of the city. You're getting to see a lot of these cool little nooks. And you're getting to see these drivers doing insane things. And, you know, it's 1969, so there's no CGI. Everything we're seeing is happening. Uh, and it's amazing. Like they drive these Mini Coopers onto the roof of like a museum to hide from the cops, and then drive back down. They're like charging through water and over aqueducts. They're going through the sewers. Doing jumps. They're doing jumps. They're doing these amazing jumps. They're they're loading onto the back of a truck from the highway. Apparently, I don't know if this is true or an urban legend or not, but the city of Turin refused to shut down the streets for them to film. So the local mafia got involved and got it shut down and then got, got them like a bunch of money for the production. So apparently this is a mafia co-production <laughs> if, if, room, if legends are to be believed. But they really pulled off some amazing, amazing stunt driving in this movie. Uh, and this whole sequence is so much fun. Uh, and uh, it culminates in an ending that I think is such a brilliant little touch and such a fun little way to close out this movie. Now, 
Uh, first of all, they are unloading these Mini Coopers out of the back of a bus, uh, which results in one of my favorite things, which is just a car falling down a hill. It's one of my favorite movie things ever, and they do it <laughs> so many times in this film. I, like, the way you phrased it, technically correct. They were unloading Mini Coopers out the back of a bus. They were. However, they were doing it while driving on a winding, like, uh, mountainous, mountainous road. road. Right. And they were basically throwing them out the back. They are. Yeah, they're just literally like they wait till they get to a curve. They yell now and they shove it out the truck. And we get three long sustained sequences of these Mini Coopers getting smashed to bits as they fall down this Italian mountain. And it's really fun. Um, But that leaves them with nothing but this big empty bus and this really heavy pallet of gold bars. So they're taking these turns. The pallet is shifting all over the place. It sends them off balance, and they wind up uh, almost going off the road so that the bus is teetering right on the edge of the cliff. And they have it situated so that the crew is all on one end and the gold is all on the other. And if they move, they're going to send everything off. If they get out of the bus, then they're all going to go off. And so they're just kind of stuck in this precarious situation trying to figure out how to get the gold. And that's how the movie ends. Literally on a cliffhanger. He he literally says, hold on, I've got a plan. And then it just zooms out to the bus. It's just a, hanging there and they the credits start to roll. It's a really fun way to end it. Now, I, I, apparently they did want a sequel. And the, the sequel was going to begin with some helicopters coming in and holding up the end of the uh, bus and then them getting out of there. Um, that seems like such a cop out. It seems like a cop out. Now, I, I read that uh, the Royal Society of Chemists in the UK in 2008, they held a contest to see who could figure out the best way that they can get out of there with the gold in under 30 minutes. The winning selection was this. Okay. Uh, and I don't even actually know that this would work. I think this is not a practical plan. But the winner said this. Okay, you, you punch out one of the windows in the back, let the glass go outside. You punch out one of the windows inside, let it go inside. One person goes out the window on a rope. They dangle down underneath the car and drain the fuel tank so that the balance is shifted enough that one man can leave the bus. And then that one man goes and gets big heavy rocks and starts bringing them back into the bus until it's equaled out. The men start taking the gold out bar by bar until it's like balanced enough. Then they all get out, let the bus fall, hijack the next car that comes by and take the gold that way. I have a question for you, Justin. Yeah. This is going to sound ignorant on my on my half, but is it true that most cars are rear wheel drive cars? Like are buses rear wheeled as well? Is so, that why they couldn't just drive on? Uh. This is an interesting question because there's two different answers to your question. Okay. One, uh, most vehicles are front-wheel drive. Mm-hmm. Um, your car's front-wheel drive. Me and Steve's cars are rear-wheel drive because usually the, the bigger, more like performance-build cars are rear-wheel drive. Uh, and I'm pretty sure the uh, the 300 was a rear-wheel drive. It's an old car, technically. It's on a very old platform. I believe it. Um, I don't know. But front wheel drive is easier for economy and for uh, like space. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not the best for handling. But uh, buses are a totally different story because one, they're usually going to be rear wheel drive. Two, they're going to be diesel. Um, and so, yes, the bus was most likely rear wheel drive. Um, I would assume, now that I'm thinking about it, it's a very long drive shaft. And it's like a modified bus, too, so it's kind of hard to say. But I think for the purpose of kind of the allegory that they're going for here, that that, uh, uh, Charlie has kind of finally found himself in a situation that he can't talk himself out of, and it's either like save the crew or save the gold kind of situation, you know? Well, he's clearly, I think he's just going to be indecisive and get arrested. I think he's going to end up eating uh, spaghetti four times a day. Yeah. Like uh, Like they say at the beginning, yeah, look, that that does not sound like a bad prison situation. Yeah, yeah. I fucking love spaghetti. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully they've got some Parmesan. But it's it's such a fun and audacious way to end this movie. Just like the it it's it could have been a downer ending. It could have been like a crime doesn't pay kind of ending, and they wound up landing on something much more ironic and funny. Um, it's interesting. A movie I watched recently that I won't name uh, because I don't want to ruin the ending, and it's literally in cinema right now. Uh, like the sort of 
immoral people had a very happy ending yeah and i'm just like it's really interesting about the change in times about like because there was a time with like the haze code when you couldn't have a happy ending no and um Definitely 69 was post haste code, but I thought it was really interesting that they, t- instead of giving the heist men uh, <laughs> uh, a happy ending, they left them on this like edge of cliffhanger. Like they decided not to uh, either say yay or nay that these are the good guys winning the day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not quite like that, you know, and it's not like an Ocean's Eleven thing where we're like necessarily rooting for these guys to win. You know, we're we're kind of. You know they're 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 not great guys, you know, but like we're uh, it, it's still really funny way to end the movie. Um, I'm glad they never really followed it up with the helicopter thing. That would have been a cop out. I agree. But um, one last thing I want to mention about this movie is that it's written by a guy named Troy Kennedy Martin, who a uh, uh, famous British screenwriter. He worked on a lot of stuff. Oh, Scottish. Excuse me. Yeah, famous famous uh, UK. There we go. <laughs> um, and. Uh, he he did a lot of like British TV. He did Edge of Darkness, which we mentioned uh, last week, actually, because that's a Martin Campbell uh, miniseries, uh, the director of uh, Mask of Zorro. And uh, he died in 2009, but he had his final screenplay public, uh, uh, produced six months ago uh, with the movie Ferrari. Um, he wrote the biopic oh. about Enzo Ferrari that Michael Mann directed. So he has a recent screenplay credit, uh, despite having died 15 years ago. So... That's one other thing I want to throw uh, out about this. I'm going to confirm uh, the bus in the movie was a Bedford Val, and they are rear-wheel drive, and they have the, the they have three axles. The rear one, well, three axle pairs, presumably. Uh, the rear one is drive. The front two are both steering. Oh, perfect. Okay. To, uh, to help it get around corners and stuff. And plus the way they were teetering, they, like they didn't really have wheels on the ground yeah, necessarily. Like they, yeah, they were, uh, it looked like they were basically high-centered. Yeah, um, yeah. So unless they were able to shift the weight, it would have been rough. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's jump into the game here because uh, the game is interesting. It, it came out. Uh, it was released in May third of two thousand two. Uh, it's developed by Pixel Logic and published by Rockstar, and it was released on the PS one and the PC. So that's a very long is time. Is there a reason why that it came? Like, was it an anniversary? That's the thing. I I don't think so because the the remake doesn't come out until two thousand three. So like that was probably in the work at this time maybe it was kind of more of a concerted push to get the movie like more in uh, uh, the public mind space but I think it was more like you said it's kind of like a Scarface thing where it was a slow growing cult favorite uh, especially in the UK and uh, so they you know the same same logic that led to them making the Scarface game probably led to them making the Italian job game Um now I'm gonna I'm gonna give this some praise like right off the bat and say that they really uh they really paid attention to the vibe of the movie and they really found ways to gamify all the different story beats. Um, you know, like sometimes excessively and sometimes uh, a little uh, obtusely. Uh, we played it on the PS1. So there's a lot of like readjusting to old tech going on here. There's a lot of like pop up and draw distance issues, a lot of very jagged edges, very loose controls. Uh, I. <laughs> The fidelity on the PlayStation 1 is not ideal, and so I was struggling to tell. I kept forgetting and driving on the 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 right side of the road, right. assuming the cars weren't coming at me, because I also couldn't tell the front from the back until I was hitting it. This is my issue with driving games. I, I've always had trouble with driving games, um, especially of this generation, because so much of a driving game is incumbent on being able to see the road ahead of you like you need a good long bit of runway so that you can strategize and kind of get into place and figure out what you're going to do and on the ps1 you really couldn't do that because sometimes like a building would just appear in front of you out of nowhere you know and you you just get fucked up that way so it became a grind of like just doing the tracks over and over again until you memorize yeah. every curve, you know, and that I just never really had the patience for that. What do you, you're more? Are you more of a racing game person? I know you're really into cars in real life. Yeah, but. Um, I actually, uh, in a similar vein to this, there was a video game series called Driver. Yeah, and which uh, this one reminded me of a lot. Actually, yeah, yeah, I I've been replaying it emulated recently. Yeah, and uh, the first one, uh, PlayStation One. Uh, I I'd, honestly it was kind of muscle memory but I don't think it had stick usage. I think you had to use the D-pad for it. Could be, um, yeah. Yeah. 
and uh, it was in- it's interesting to compare the two. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I feel like Driver was the better game. Like, oh, it's definitely the better the game. Piece, I think the pieces definitely felt a lot better. Um, in yeah. This game was very sensitive, but I thought it was really fun because uh, it was really funny. Steve and Justin, when they first started playing, they were like, yeah, let's follow the rules. I was like, fuck the rules. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We we. OK. So the, yeah, like you start off with the section where he's getting picked up from prison in the Pakistani ambassador's car, you know, and they are gamifying this by making it that like we can't be seen by the police or they'll chase the car down and we'll get nicked again. And then. So we're, me and Justin are just like driving through the streets and then cops see us and start chasing us. And J-Ben's just There's, like, no, I'm going to go around. I'm going to see if I can just avoid them entirely. It's like they they push you towards a T-intersection and off to the side of that T-intersection is a parked police car. And so in my head, I was like, oh, this is just something that you have to deal with. You know what? Yeah. None of us tried stopping at the intersection. Yeah. Obeying the traffic rules. Yeah. What if that would have been the only thing that you needed to do was obey the traffic rules? They'll rules. be like, oh, carry on, mate. <laughs> J-Ban discovered the thing to do, which was take a sharp left before they can see you, drive a little bit, cut right through an alleyway, come back around, and go basically on the other side of where the police car was, and then just drive through an open area off a big fucking ramp. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you want. A ramp. Yeah. And but then it, land back in the street it worked out great but it's a ramp yeah i thought it was a hedge and then you went off it and i was like what i mean excuse me so i i think i you know there there are there are definitely fun moments in this game and like when you're looking ahead we we did uh uh look at some youtube videos to see a little further down into the game because uh spoiler but this game is very hard for me at least Uh, i was doing Uh, very poorly i don't think we only i only got past like the first uh, level or two to clarify one of the things that made it so hard as jay ben kind of mentioned the the left stick sensitivity is so high yeah and and it's weird because it is non-linear yeah. And so when you were driving at a slow speed, you uh, you kind of have to give it some beans to get a turn going. Right. And once you start getting uh, to a reasonable speed, you you give it the same amount of beans, and you have basically done a one eighty. Yeah. Um. You you turn so fast, and so it's definitely something you have to get used to. And I think J Band. I'm talking about beans. Are you meaning acceleration? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Other beans. Other beans. Sideways beans. Sideways uh, beans. Horizontal beans. Okay. Not, not vertical beans. Okay, cool. Wait, what? <laughs> I don't understand the difference between sideways and horizontal beans. In the sense of an axis. Or ag- uh, oh, I see. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. X is uh, forward beans. Y is sideways beans. Okay. And then the vertices is where the beans uh, touch. That's when you moving, place, right? moving on. <laughs> the, the vertices moving, is when you're not moving on. Moving. <laughs> yeah, but no, I, I think... The the issue I was running into with this one is that, like, this is kind of all you do. Like, every mission is sort of like, uh, get your car from this place to this place, don't get caught. You know, and so yeah. it feels like little bite-sized chunks. Like, you, you mentioned Driver. Like, Driver had a little bit more variety in the missions. They would combine, like, on foot and in-car stuff. So like, that was only in number two. Number right. one is only in the car. But I will say the... The narrative was better and made it more interesting because in in Driver you would finish a mission, yeah, and then you would get like a cutscene and some story stuff happening, some voices happening. In uh, in in uh, the Italian job, what you get is you get there's no like pre rendered cutscenes or anything. It's just straight from like you finish the thing, you get an incredible voiceover, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Oh boy. Okay, so we were we were debating the relative merits of uh, different actors' Cockney accents, and uh, the guy that they got to impersonate Michael Caine here is really doing one. Uh, he's really going for it. It does not like he's got the cadence right. Like he's he sounds like Michael Caine's like speaking voice, but it, it's. It's really high and rage, isn't it? And it's all... It's filled with rage. Yeah, yeah. It's filled with rage. 
it's uh, very uh, unconvincing and kind of like caustic on your ear when it first comes out of the speakers. It's just it's like, so, oh boy. Yeah, he, he basically plays the narrator. And so you go from one thing, like for instance, you finish a mission and then it just cuts to the beginning of the set piece for the next mission with a really short narrative over like the, let's say like later the bus scene. Yeah. A really short narrative over the bus driving of like uh, one of the most uninspired and terrible accents going like, yeah, and now we got to load the cars up on the bus. Yeah. And then you load the cars up on the bus. And it's like, it, it doesn't have, it doesn't take you away from it in a good way. Right. Like, give you anything. Like, if they had maybe included some, like, cutscenes trying to replicate things that happened in between these scenes. Yeah. The, the few that are there are not great because they're all done in engine. And so that means that they're done in the game. Right. So like you using like their development tools, they've like they're just it's a render of the game. So what you get is like the scene where they're throwing the mini coopers out the back. That's the thing. Yeah, you you're get the, you get them throwing out mini coopers on like like ice skates that are just sliding down the uh yeah. the the scenery. They don't roll, they don't explode, they don't break apart. They're just like basically no, you're just dropping off three uh, cars. Yeah. This game doesn't really have any like effects in terms of like particle damage anything like that. No. There's there's nothing in the air ever. There's no smoke. Um or at least there's very little smoke if there is ever when they um, drive through the water there's no water spray there's none no of that spray. the the water is just a moving texture on the floor and so it's really shiny and it uh it doesn't really look great but this is the playstation one it's but look you can forgive um, a lot of that i and i but I, I think part of the problem too is that the game is sold and the movie is so well known for the Mini Coopers, right? The game is sold on the strength of being able to drive these Mini Coopers and recreate this uh, classic escape scene, which they do. Like, to be to be clear, like, you do get to do the getaway sequence, and from the video that we watched, it's pretty one-to-one. -one. Like, you, yeah. you drive up on the museum, yeah. you go through the tunnels, you're, like, it's, you're hitting the beats exactly when they're hitting the beats in the movie, and that's very fun. But most of the game, you're playing, like, the, the ambassador's car, or you're driving the bus, or you're doing stuff like that. Yeah, like because the, the, you only drive in this game. There is it's all there else. is, yeah. And so when you're taking a movie and adapting it, it's harder to do. Like, for instance, with Driver, it's not a movie. It's an original story. Right. You're able to make it fit. Well, it's interesting, because I do feel like of the video games that we play, they're very rarely one-for-one -one remakes. Yeah, and I feel like this is probably one of the closest one to one remakes of at least of all the action scenes. Yeah. I mean the the beginning they do take liberty with the Pakistani ambassador's car uh, because there was no car chase in that. Yeah, but yeah. we're still hitting the beats they, when they hit them in the movie. They, yeah, they basically have to take all of the things because like a lot of the movie is like the narrative moments where it's people talking, and they basically have to find a way to boil all that down to cars. Yeah. Um, and so it's a lot of like driving from here to here and like the police are here. And it's like, this didn't really happen in the movie, so, but we're just bridging gaps. To of all make the cars that were along. destroyed, which one hurt your heart the most? Um, man, uh, the the two Jaguar E types that get destroyed. Oh, yeah. And the um, Aston. I do love an Aston Martin, and yeah. that one yeah. gets yeah. smashed up. It was a convertible, and I don't know how I feel about convertibles from that era. It's, oh, okay. I'm not high on them. What do you mean? Um, uh, the convertibles are amazing. I love convertibles. You no, own a convertible. From that era. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it just looks interesting. Um, I'm not a big fan of it. I'm not a big fan of a lot of convertibles hmm. um, because a lot of times it's like it locks you down to color choices or else the top is going to look weird. Okay. And that's a thing that I've always thought about is like they used to do a lot of like cream colored soft tops. And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, I just hated that so much. I used to drive this one. This one is a, a gray colored, a, a dark gray uh but yeah, I like the uh, the Aston's from that era. I really like. Yeah, I'm just not big on the convertible versions of them. That's fair. Uh, and the and the Jags do get smashed up way more. Yeah, yeah. And that that Maria in the beginning. Although my understanding is that it was a replica car. That was a replica. Good. Yeah, the real the real Maria that they used in this movie was found uh, in a lot and like won at an auction like four or yeah, five years ago. I, 
I hope that the the Jaguars were also replica cars. I think some of them were, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure, but yeah, I can't, I'm not entirely sure about which ones were real or not, but you know, that's, that's more of what I wanted to see because this is a movie that is so much about, like so much of the visual storytelling is in the damage to the cars. Mm-hmm. And when you lose the damage to the cars in these race sequences, it just feels a little chintzy, you know, and I know we were limited by technology, but it might have just been a good excuse the to sprites wait. sprites looked so bad. Of the Cuban characters? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For some reason, the Michael Caine model looks like Kevin Spacey, <laughs> and it was grossing me out. Like, he's just walking in with, like, this thumb-looking face. You know, so it, I, I, don't, I don't think this game's a disaster by any means. I, I think it's, it's perfectly serviceable. It just, um, and, and it, it does hew very closely to the source material oh. in an interesting way. But it, I think driving games are a hard sell for me, and you need to give me a little something special to like get me into it. So like, I'm really into the burnout games because those are all about yes. wrecks. They're all about mm-hmm. destruction, and they're almost like more of a puzzle game or a party game than you get here. By the way, there's a mode in this game called Party Mode that makes for the least interesting party of all time. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a it's a it's time trials. It's it's not like simultaneous playing it's, it's hand it's, off the controller, yeah, the controller time beat my trial. time that's but, so boring drive through these uh, gates faster than me i wanted Dull. to point out i i just uh figured it out uh the they did use an actual miria to push off the cliff okay however they they used two mo- two for the movie one was a proper functioning car okay and one was a totaled already crashed car oh that they used so they just put so like a they, shell on it yeah so they they basically just did damaged an already wrecked car which is better than like for instance one of the reasons why dodge chargers from the the 70s are so hard to find um they became more popular in modern era due to like the fast and furious movies and stuff but they wrecked like hundreds of them for yeah the filming of the uh blues brothers no what the, the matrix them duke boys oh dukes of hazard uh, dukes of hazard oh. for the tv show oh because wow because they made they had so many uh duplicate cars and they didn't use replicas for a lot of it and they needed a car so stunt every episode of that show yeah episode in something that a lot of people don't know is you can't really jump a car hmm. it totals the car Oh yeah, coming back down like that, uh, it bends the frame, it destroys the suspension. Yeah, it takes a lot of work to then restore. So they just junkyarded all of it. Yeah, them. isn't it? And don't they have to to do a barrel roll? Don't they have to like shoot a piston down into the ground to make it flip? Uh, yeah, oftentimes usually. Sometimes one of the directions. Yeah, it's either pushing up or it's pushing down to mm-hmm. make the car flip because cars turn out. Don't want to flip. They're they're generally not designed for that. Correct. <laughs> Usually, if your car is flipping, uh, uh, that's a problem. Yeah, but it, you know, so there, there's a lot of. I I think the game is perfectly serviceable. I I would have wanted just a little bit more you know like not just the driving sequences just a little bit something else to bring me in but like it's not it's not a terrible game. Uh, I want to jump back to the movie for a second, please. What was up with the Italian mafia? They, yeah, that's the thing. They, that's, they, they, they usually have, so usually uh, the Italian mafia usually had protection. Oh, right. Like, so they were paid protection money for things to happen. Mm-hmm. So like ideally, like the people transferring that money were probably paying protection money to the mafia for it not to be stolen. No, I, I get And that. they probably wanted but a cut, yeah. What happened was they, they roll in and basically like stop the guys and are like, hey, look, here's the deal. You're going to pull this job, right? Yeah. Nah, uh And then they recognize the three cars that they were planning on using for the job um and then that's like it oh so michael kane threatens to um create a mob war between the british mob and the italian mob yeah. if they kill them and because he has the backing of mr bridger it's okay. definitely insinuated that that war could happen so they let him go to see whether or not they could actually fulfill the okay. they but basically did enough that they'd be like look we tried yeah they they he, whack the guy in the beginning and then they yes. they have that scene where they intimidate and break down the car. But you're right, like when it comes down to it, the the only thing like threatening them during that chase scene are the police, and, so and the the mafia doesn't really enter into the plot after that. That I think will be different between this movie and the next movie is uh, revenge. Ooh yeah, because they didn't seem to be too concerned about the fact that the mafia killed 
uh, the original guy. No, yeah, they're very kind of hand wavy about they that. Were just kind of like ah, it's whatever. because he was Italian, so he was probably not working for the British mob. The only he only started working for the British mob when uh, he needed backing for the job. Well, he he seemed to know Charlie specifically, yeah, so maybe Charlie. maybe right. they were like friends. But Charlie yeah. didn't have the support of the British mob until he he actively sought out and like he broke you didn't, we you didn't see this, but he broke into the prison to, and to Mr. Bridger's bathroom yeah. to to get him to back the 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 gambit. And I, I again, I just really need to shout out Noel Coward because I love this archetype of a mob boss where he is. A very, very calm, very uh, stiff upper lip, like British lord, basically, who has the entire prison completely under his thumb and uh, the drop of his name intimidates the Italian mafia to back off. Like, that's a fun character to play. He ne- he never has to play it intimidating. Well, and if you talk about this movie, I, like, I can't believe we've talked about this movie this much without having its... Um sort of its heirs apparent of oh, like yeah. the Guy Ritchie films. Sure, yeah. Uh, the the, the whole British crime, Snatch yeah, Rabbit. yeah, the whole British crime subgenre definitely like owes a lot to this and it just gets more and more stylized and outlandish like especially with when you combine it with like the Pulp Fiction influences like yeah, in the 90s. I, I think it's interesting because you can just like kind of go through the Guy Ritchie films yeah. and you start to feel that drift where like lock stock and two loaded barrels two smoking barrels two smoking yeah. barrels kind of a comedy yeah. no it, oh yeah no, it's absolutely a comedy it's 100%. Comedic. no most uh, of guy ritchie's movies are comedies Snatch, yeah comedy more serious yeah. still comedic yeah. but they they definitely are stylistically more serious yeah. overall as you progress through Maybe I need to oh, give those another chance. I've I've always been very I, uh, cold on Guy Ritchie. Maybe I need to give those a I shot. I really liked Snatch. I like yeah. Snatch. Lock I remember Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. He just okay. he, he, he's I one really of those guys like that should Lock work Stock for me. Two Smoking Barrels. Because uh, like I feel, and again, this is like me going to college in the UK. Uh, like there's a lot of class discussion. Yeah. That's implicit. That uh, like generally speaking, uh, these people are like very um uh displaced cl- uh people who are uh on the edges and fringes of society and even if they wanted to improve their lives the only way they could improve their lives is if they change their voice yeah because like in the uk uh i mean it's getting better but like uh if you had an accent like that you were fucked for your, your entire life yeah um yeah, I, I might have to rewatch it. I haven't seen it in almost a decade. Yeah, it's probably um, been long, I, at least that long, a long time. I had yeah. been given a relative's DVDs that they didn't want anymore, and it was one of them, and I was like, oh, this seems like fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah I'll well, check it out. we... It's funny because... Sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> but it's funny because um, I, I have a real problem with the Cohen brothers because it has I, I find the people like the the half acid heist so fucking frustrating oh okay see, you you somehow, like to see the shoe leather you like to see the 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 you like to see the clockwork intricate nature of it too. yeah yeah well I like I like competent people sure and like burn after reading like it's just everyone's so fucking incompetent and like it's kind of why that movie's funny in, yeah well and I get it intellectually yeah. however viscerally it drives me fucking crazy and, and like and again I uh, the chaotic part of me is like yeah this is how crime actually happens like there's this really great podcast called ridiculous crimes oh yeah that is like people doing stupid shit every single week and there's never there is never uh, an ending to how stupid people are and yeah. how stupid like trying to be a criminal is yeah so i understand it intellectually with the coen brothers that, uh, and i do love old brother Wild, though. oh yeah uh but like, like it frustrates me to see incompetent criminals like it really stresses me out but if you add them with a british accent i somehow don't bother the there you the go it doesn't Dude. bother me so much they're charming they're uh, charming now yeah that reminds me of one of my favorite like D and D, uh, like saying comparisons, and it's like you go into it thinking it's gonna be you're gonna be like you know badass Lord of the Rings or Ocean's Eleven or whatever, and you're just Monty Python. Yeah, no matter how hard you try, it becomes Monty Python of like shit. We're really not that good at this, are we? Right, <laughs> we right. We thought we were gonna be the badass criminals, and uh, we, 
It spent us half an hour. We Which did half an hour to exactly just do crazy stuff. Exactly what happened in the Italian job. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. Well, I think we're we're probably going to have more to say about this movie next week as well. So I let's so. let's let's close this out with our rankings. Uh, do we think this is a good movie, good game, bad movie, bad game, or some mixture in between? Uh, I'll kick us off on this one. I loved this movie. I had so much fun with it. It was a first time watch. I think it's got a really infectious energy. It's got amazing car stunts and uh, just just good vibes all around. I enjoyed the Italian job. The game I was pretty mediocre on. You know, I thought it was uh, functional and competent, but just not really my cup of tea. So I'm going to say it's a mid. Uh, I'm going to say even despite my... um I don't know, the pressure of my first watching. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to say it was a good movie Mm -hmm. uh, and um, a a good movie with some issues. Sure. uh, And an okay game. Yeah. Yeah. um, I'm really annoyed with myself for not watching this one. Um, It's a very just any movie. Yeah. I I, I would say go through and watch it again. Like, watch the whole thing because it's it's really Um, fun. From what I saw, it seemed like a fun movie. It seemed like something I would enjoy. Um, The game was, uh, it was a game. It was okay. Um, if I had rented it during that era, I probably would have been okay with it. If I had bought it during that era, I might have been a little annoyed or a little, uh, a little unsatisfied, dissatisfied with my purchase. Yeah. Um, Reasonable. Yeah. yeah. Well, we are going to have uh, a much more Italian job to discuss next week when we talk about our next movie, which is coincidentally called The Italian Job. It's the 2003 remake, the American remake with Mark Wahlberg, Edward Norton, Charlie Theron, a whole bunch of fun people in Seth that. Uh, a, a movie I, I saw once, I remember liking it, um, but I'm, I'm curious to revisit it. These early 2000s action movies kind of age like milk in a lot of ways. So we'll, we'll see how this one holds up. Yeah, but I've, I've seen it. In the last little, you know, five years or so. And I feel like I, it held up okay. Either way, we'll see. Yeah. We, we'll see. Will see. we will see. We will see. So uh, rev up your engines, folks. We will see you next time. You were only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>